Domingo Romero. Um, I will open now a short presentation for the introduction and to explain the course of the event. Uh, my name is Maya Lu. Um, I am uh, the educational referee of the Afro-Asian Institute in Salzburg. And yeah, so we are very happy that um, Alejandro Montelongo Romero is here and will present this uh, very exciting topic. Um, Alejandro uh, is an uh, environmental engineer from Mexico, and he's uh, currently studying environment process and energy engineering at the Management Center in Innsbruck in Austria. And that's why he's also one of our One World Scholarship holders um, from the AAI. Um, he's currently also involved in a project which is called High Metz Ship. It's a research project uh, in Graz and it's focusing on how marine transportation can be more sustainable. Um, yeah, so I will also explain now um, how the course of the event will be. Um, the duration of the talk will be one hour and there will be 30 to 40 minutes input by um, Mr. Montedango. And afterwards, we invite all of, uh, of you to discuss and ask questions. Um, the webinar will be recorded and afterwards also published on our YouTube channel. So um, if anybody wants uh, prefer to be anonymous, shall give a pseudonym or turn off the video. Um, we also stream the webinar on Facebook. So anybody who doesn't want to take part in this, but watch it on Facebook, it's also possible. And um, yeah, so, but anyway, we really um, encourage people to use also video and the microphone and really participate. It's more interactive if we see each other and talk together. Um, during the speech, please turn on off your microphone. It's anyway done now like this, but later on you can turn it off yourself or I also try to help you if you need some help. Um, in this case. And the chat beside um, uh, or within the webinar is open during the whole uh, talk and discussion. So anybody who wants to ask any question can also use the chat. I will also uh, note points which are relevant for the discussion later. Um, then, yeah, as said, we really invite everybody uh, to the discussion afterwards. And if you need any technical support, you can also use the chat or there's also this number. Um, maybe I will also write it once more into the chat. If you have any technical problems, you can also call. Okay, so I give over to Alejandro. <laughs> um, Thank you so much, Maya. Now, so let the uh, other people in <laughs> who are still waiting. Yeah, so. Okay, uh, perfect. Thank you so much for uh, um, this uh, space, online space to, to present you uh, a really interesting topic in my opinion. Uh, it's, it's a quite complex topic, so I think um, I would just try to give you some general input about it because uh, yeah, it's such a complex program as this one. It's not so easy to address in one hour, but I will try my best to make it interactive and interesting for you all. So thanks for being here. <clears throat> I will share with you uh, some small presentation I prepared for, for this webinar and I hope you find it nice. <clears throat> so, okay, let's do this. So ecological turnaround in Mexico City. Um, well, um, as we all know, uh, Mexico City is it's a, it's a capital of, of Mexico. It's a, it's considered a mega city due to the high population that, that it's uh, currently living there. And with these mega cities, there always come a series of different environmental problems. Uh, some of them, or the main main ones related to to mega cities, are uh, air pollution the water availability and wastewater treatment as well, 
uh, a massive uh, waste generation, uh, all kinds of waste. Uh, also, now it's being addressed as a really important topic, the climate, climate change adaptation and mitigation. Um, also, we have some human pollution and visual pollution as well in these mega cities. So those two uh, topics will not be so touched by this presentation. Um, so the first topic or the first environmental problem I want to discuss or talk a bit about, it's the air pollution in Mexico City. And well, um, air pollution, where does it come from? Of which are the sources in Mexico City? As you could assume or imagine a super uh, dense uh, city as, uh, like Mexico City has different sources for, for the air pollution. And in this uh, small infographic that it's presented in Spanish, you can uh, see the distribution of, of some energy consumption and where these uh, air pollution sources are arriving most. So 61%, we have some gasoline, diesel, turbosine, and other types. So we can uh, easily notice that the main source of air pollution in, in, the, in Mexico City or the um, valley of the Mexico City population, it's related to transport, um, continued by um, electricity, production of electricity, natural gas, and another ones, then followed by, uh, by households and commerce services uh, companies, etc. So what <clears throat> I, I want to talk to you about um, a bit about it, what it's the criteria pollutants that are normally addressed, uh, used to address the, the air pollution in cities. These criteria pollutants are uh, used widely worldwide and uh, they are the main components to, to establish if, if uh, air quality is good enough or it's bad. So, I mean, the main criteria pollutants or indicators of air quality in a city like Mexico City are ozone, um, tropospheric ozone, because we also have the stratospheric one, which is the one that protects us for UV radiation. Um, but the tropospheric ozone is the one we, it's not desired because it has really bad side effects on health. Uh, we also have carbon monoxide that it's created by uh, incomplete combustion, so especially uh, of cars and other sources, the sulfur dioxide, but it's also a source uh, by transport mainly. Uh, so the ni nitrogen dioxide or NOx as well, different compounds of, of these nitrates uh, that are also really bad for, for air quality. And as well, the particulate ma matter, so uh, PM10 or PM2.5, which is, um, and this particular matter is normally also associated, uh, as its name indicates, it's just small particles. And the number 10 or 2.5 just indicates the, the, the size of these particles. So PM10, it's uh, for address a particulate matter minor than 10 micrometers. So this is some small, really small particles that we all breathe in uh, when there is a huge concentration of these particles and the pollution. Uh, we, we can have severe uh, effects on our health and can affect especially vulnerable uh, people like kids or adults, etc. So the same with the PM 2.5, which are probably even more deadly due to the really, really small size that can um, go into our lungs. <clears throat> so, uh, I want to talk about a bit about two different phenomena that make this this air pollution worse in Mexico City. And um, Mexico City is in a location that is quite complex because it's a really high city uh, in the um, regarding sea level. So we are talking about a city that it's 2,000 or in average 2,200 meters above sea level. So it, it's in a high range. And it's also surrounded by a mountain chain. So, so the configuration or, or where it's located itself uh, have been a problem for, for air pollution uh, because the, the whole mountain range around it uh, acts like a bubble and makes the air distribution to, 
to what makes your city uh, harder. And we also, or I also want to address some other problems that are uh, fire or fire in, in forest around this area. And normally, if they are, if there is some fires in the north part of the city where there is like the entering uh, entrance of the air. Uh, we 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 can get days with really really bad pollution or air really poor air quality in Mexico City, and well, this effect of the mountains uh, makes that the that the bad air quality uh, remain for for several days there, and it's, it's it's quite bad. The other effect I want to talk about is the thermal or thermic inversion. Which is which will be better explained by the graph here on the right side. So it's an effect of when, especially when when it's um, this effect is most uh, more common in December or January in, uh, in Mexico City, and it's referred to to it's a phenomenon given by temperature and altitude. So uh, this the thermic inversion, what it does is that it um, it stops the convection uh, within the Valley of Mexico or the city of Mexico. So when, uh, as you know, convection uh, works in a, in a circular way. So if we have a hot air, it will go up and then it will get colder. And then it makes this circle and makes the airflow to, to the city. Uh, uh, it makes the flow to the city. And when we have this thermic inversion, it becomes that uh, some, um, hotter part gets up the layer so the there is no movement of, or the convection it's kind of stopped so this this um this is a problem because then the, the pollutant concentration all these pm10 pm2 the ozone the um the nitrates and all the other criteria pollutants or pollutants are trapped between uh, in within uh, the whole city and and this is when we can hear uh, on the news that there are some environmental crises. And I mean, I, I will tell you a bit about some strategies the government have implemented to, to reduce or to, to attack this problem, which is uh, a huge problem. Uh, according to the um, Health World Organization, uh, just in Mexico City, there is around 14,700 deaths related to bad air quality or, or air pollution. So you can see that the magnitude of the problem is it's really high. And it's a problem in, in a big problem in major cities. Uh, I mean, some of the, here I just put some graphs for comparison between Mexico City and New Delhi, which is the one of the most polluted uh, air, or the worst air quality cities in the world. Here, it does not seem that Mexico City is doing so bad, at least in um, particles PM um, 2.5. But in reality, uh, yeah, we, we can see some peaks, especially here in January and also in May. And this phenomenon is related to one, what I was talking about, like in December, January, we get the thermic inversion. And in May, which is uh, one of the hottest times of the year in, in Mexico, we can also get the um, the forest fires, which uh, make the, the problem uh, a lot more complicated and uh, increase the air pollution in the Mexico City. So uh, here I just wanted to compare a bit on onto the case of Europe, so you can just uh, look over. Also, the scales that I use um, are quite different, and uh, this is something interesting to to just notice. And well, as some programs and actions for, for air pollution that the government in Mexico City have been uh, pushing to, to, to reduce this problem is, uh, I mean, there is a, a policy about uh, vehicles. So uh, depending on, on the day, there are some cars that are not allowed to go through the city and people can get fined if they are uh, using the car in certain days because there is a calendar and it's an organized uh, way. Um, there is also the encouragement of non-motorized transport by different means. Uh, for example, this program that utilizes it's called EcoBici, which is uh, just a, a program for people to start using bike over 
over the other means of transport. Uh, so this is some some manners that the the government have been uh, uh, pursuing the reduction of air pollution in Mexico City. There is also the vehicle verification program and some other aspects. Um, yeah. Uh, now I want to address another problem or that it's also really critical in, in Mexico City and that every year it's clear that it would be a huge problem in the whole area of the Valley of Mexico. And it's a water availability. Uh, as I mentioned, like uh, Mexico City, it's, it's a city that it's really high. And this makes difficult the transport of, of clean water to, to, to the whole city. Uh, and also makes it quite expensive because uh, if you need to pump water up, uh, this costs energy and so on. And so the, the availability of water, it's it have been and it is a huge problem in Mexico City. Um, for example, at this moment, 90% of the city can have access to water, but there are some parts that have uh, intermittent availability to water and uh, I mean, the, the whole network has a lot of failures. Uh, it is accepted by the government itself that the, the pipe system it's, uh, has a lot of crackdowns and there is even up to 40% of water loss through, just through the piping um, in, in this city. And this is something really, really special about the city. Um, I mean, if, if we go back a bit into the history of, of the city, um, the the whole the whole valley used to be yeah, we used to have a lake, and uh, this makes a lot of complications. No, and there is some particular uh, characteristics about about this that make it even uh, harder. Uh, it's well known that Mexico City is a city that is drowning every year, in average by ten to thirty centimeters per year. So it's getting it's going down. And this is due to two different effects. The, the first one is that the the main aquifer, where where the the water is taken, um, the water supply in Mexico City comes seventy percent out of the Valley of Mexico aquifer. So this means that a huge amount of water is being extracted uh, all over uh, this valley, and there is around thousand five hundred wells. Uh, where the uh, 15,000 wells where the where the water is being extracted and the other the remaining 30 percent of the water it's it's taken uh, from the Lerma Kutmala basin. So as a lot of people will think that most of the water to Mexico City comes from water bodies, but in reality it comes from the aquifer and this this effect is what it's making uh, Mexico City drowning this 10 to 30 centimeters per year. And the problem about this drowning is that the, it's different in different parts of the city. So where, wherever you have uh, a differential drowning within the city, this makes that the, the soil layers are moving and also the pipe system. And that's why there is such a huge amount of, of uh, water loss in, in the piping systems. So as you see, the, the problem is quite complex, and we will see as well that the taking so much water off the aquifer have been not uh, have been a really huge problem in, in different ways. Um, yeah, according to National Commission of Water, the aquifer of Mexico gets drained twice. It's the amount that it gets recharged by rainwater or other sources, and of course, as the population is increasing in the whole uh, valley of Mexico, this these numbers as well uh, increasing. So for example, this is what I was mentioning that the whole uh, place used to be a lake and this also makes the, the whole city uh, susceptible to drown like floating, floating. And in this small map you, you have here, uh, all the red areas are high risk floating um, places. The orange ones are like uh, high risk floating uh, yellow, it's uh, risk of floating. Green, it's not a big risk. And uh, blue, it's uh, a really, really low risk of floating. So as you see, the biggest part of, of it, it's covered in red, which, which it's related that to, the, 
to so that the whole body used to hold the lake. Um, in plus the problem of the aquifer being drained in a really intensive way, uh, this generates a lot of sprouts. So I'm just going to go here and show you some pictures of the, to show that this problem have been, uh, it's not an actual problem, it's been a problem for many, many years. So there are some really old pictures of flooding uh, in Mexico City and another problem that have been recently and it's mainly due to the uh, over extraction of water of the aquifer in the sinkholes in Mexico City this, uh, this problem it's every time more common and uh, sinkholes there are, are just huge holes that are created due to the cracking of the super layers of the ground uh, when you extract the water out of the, uh, out of the, the, the ground um, the whole stability of the soil is compromised and plus all these uh, huge amounts of buildings that are being constructed all the time uh, makes that the stability of the soil to be really um, really bad or really low generating these sinkholes all over the city uh, it has cost a lot of uh, it costs a lot of lives every year and it's it's a huge problem uh, some solutions that the government have been making of to compensate or to to address this problem it's there are, there is a huge uh, program uh, about rainwater collection systems and just in 2019 10,000 people was provided with these systems so i, I mean the, the i think the water problem in mexico city is one of the, the biggest challenges that that the city will face especially in the years to come um, uh, what else? They also mentioned that the invest, investment in pipe systems uh, should be increased in, in, in several millions in order to, to reduce the losses in the pipe systems. And of course, to increase the wastewater treatment facilities in order to reuse and maximize the use of water all over the, the valley. <clears throat> Another huge problem that uh, Mexico City has is this massive waste generation. Uh, an average person in Mexico City produces 1.5 kilograms of waste per day, and as, so per per day the whole city generates around 13,000 uh, tons of waste. Uh, from all this amount, according to to the Secretary of Environment of Mexico City, uh, just 15 percent of it is recycled or utilize uh, to create compost. So this is a really, really low uh, percentage that it's been um, converted to, to or taken to valorization of, of goods. Uh, but even though this, this problem is well known and there is a lot of uh, um, programs that are created in order, in order to, to maximize or increase this percentage of utilization of the waste, uh, I also want to talk about a bit the infrastructure they have in in city. There is around 12 transfer stations, um, two selection plants, two compactation plants, eight compost plants, and five disposal sites. And also, it's uh, public information that in the region of, of the Valley of Mexico City, there is around 1,251 clandestine dumping grounds or um, uh, yeah, landfills that are not official, they are not allowed, that they don't have permission. So this is also a big problem due to greenhouse emissions generation uh, and, and many other problems. Uh, as well, recently was approved the, the separation law for waste. So in Mexico City, there's four ways to separate uh, the waste. So the categories are organic waste, uh, inorganic recyclable waste, uh, inorganic, non-recyclable waste, and uh, special manage uh, of domestic waste, um, like computers. Um, uh, it's the, the brown part here, so you can you can notice. Um, this this is a key feature in order to to be able to reduce the, the waste problem, because uh, separation it's it's one of the first steps to to really being able to valorize uh, most of the waste. But I mean, the, the, the topic is quite complex and there is a lot of, uh, of people that it's not 
doing it, uh, the measures are not so strict and therefore uh, a lot of people don't take uh, the time to, to separate its waste. Uh, I mean, the government have implemented some different solutions, um, like they have some programs, uh, they call one rec recycloton, which means they, uh, they encourage people to, to, to bring a recyclable waste to some sites where they get points and they can exchange these points for uh, some goods and, and trade some other stuff. As well, um, yeah, the plastic bags have been forbidden in 2020, and the one usage plastics in, are being banned in 2021. Uh, as well, I want to um, talk about a bit about the climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies. Um, this government have put a lot of efforts into it and uh, into address this problem as an environmental problem as well. And I mean, in Mexico City, there is around 56.2 million of tons per year of equivalent CO2, uh, which is uh, a standard way to measure um, greenhouse emissions of a place, a company or a city, etc. So here you can see this is a small infograph that is in Spanish, but I will explain rather quickly. And you will also be able to notice that the normally environmental problems are related to each other. For example, here we have the big, uh, biggest percentage of, of methane, which is a green gas, uh, um, greenhouse uh, gas emission. It's 95% it's due to waste. This means that they are the organic waste or the majority of it is not being well treated and then it ends up in uh, landfills which have no control for, for uh, methane uh, burning or utilization. Uh, therefore, all this, this uh, organic waste that it's trapped in between the landfills, it's uh, converted to methane, then escaping to the atmosphere and generating a climate change problem. So as you can see, I'll, uh, you will be able to notice that this, or what I want you to see is that all these um, environmental problems are related within each other and uh, some solutions could also uh, be useful for different uh, types of environmental problems. Uh, but I think we could talk more about it in the discussion time. Uh, there is a lot of, of programs and strategies towards it, the Mexico City climate change vision. There's a lot of programs and associations that are addressing this problem and they are trying to, to do uh, to implement different solutions. The problem normally is that all the papers and documents that address a problem are done really well and there's a lot of people with great knowledge working on it, but the implementation of the strategies, it's sometimes the problem in, especially in a mega city like Mexico City. Uh, so there are some solutions like the Green Charge program where they are trying to repopulate uh, uh, or start to, to bring a lot of green um, uh, parts to, to the whole city. There's also the barter market and some different strategies that the government have been trying to, to make. And here I want to to, you to see some, some uh, small map about Mexico City. So you can see that the urban expansion uh, here, it's, it's uh, uh, put it by years. So here you can notice that the urban expansion of Mexico City have been uh, really dramatical. Uh, and I mean, I think this is what it makes most of the, the huge environmental problems, you know, the, the high population density in Mexico City uh, the lots of buildings that all, all of these people live in, they require these, these goods, you know, the water availability, uh, they need the transport, the mobility, and all these interactions within uh, the urban ecosystem uh, become more, more and more complex uh, while the city grows that fast. And <clears throat> here as well on the right side, you can see which areas are conservation areas, uh, which is conservation soil for the city. And uh, there is uh, still also a huge amount of irregular uh, uh, places being taken 
So this is also a big problem all over the city. And that's the presentation by itself. So I want to thank you for your attention and I would like to go to have some nice discussion with you all. Thank you very much, Alejandro, for the great presentation. So if there are any questions, please ask uh, or write it in the chat. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, please turn on your, your mm, microphone. Is there somebody? Not yet. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, uh, how is the water quality in Mexico City in general? Is it drinkable or um, yeah yeah okay um, in Mexico City and whole Mexico uh, the the supply water to the households uh, business commerce or wherever you are it's not drinkable um, I mean I think a lot of people have asked me why it's not drinkable and the problem is that uh, to, to make it uh, drinkable the expenses or the treatment of the water requests it's different and uh, normally the water that it's provided to to the city it's mainly extracted to, from the aquifer so they they mm, the water is just uh, useful for uh, different uh, daily activities but it's not drinkable so the drinkable water in mexico city and every uh, city in mexico um, needs to be bought separately mm -hmm. and is it bought then in plastic bottles or are there alternatives? Um, normally, yeah, uh, normally it's supplied to houses uh, through some basins of 20 liters. So there's companies that do this now and mm -hmm. you call them by phone and then they, they bring you these basins of water and then normally people have these basins in their houses. So if they want to drink water, they just go to the basin, get, get a um, mm -hmm. glass and fill it. So it's reused yeah. then this this twenty liter. Exactly, the plastic yeah. big containers of the twenty liters it's reused, uh, and normally when you get one, you give one back. So it's uh, it's a system where you are mm -hmm. always uh, moving these basins. Yeah, so are there any other questions? <laughs> um, again, yeah, please, or? I have a question um, about the dumping grounds. You said there were, or there are about 1,200 dumping grounds that are known officially. Um, so they are a great source of methane, but um, where did you get that number and how are they defined as uninformative or unofficial dumping ground? Yeah, um, so there are some uh, normativity regarding how a landfill or a dumping site should be in Mexico. Uh, this normativity, as any other law, it tells you how or which measures it should have, uh, especially depending on the amount of, of waste it will take. So like bigger dump or bigger official dump sites need to have more strict measures onto uh, the waste. Uh, and uh, regarding where I got the number of uh, unofficial uh, waste places, uh, it, I got it from the, from the Secretary of Environment of Mexico City official webpage, which is hilarious, no? Because they, they, know that, yeah, they know the problem, they know it exists. They even have a map where you can look where are these places and it still exist. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> I don't... I would not. I would like to to give you an answer why why this is still existing. But I mean, I think the the complex the problem itself it's complex, and probably every case has a different uh, reason or way uh, for existing. So uh, I hope I uh, answer your question. Or... Yeah, definitely. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, it's weird that they actually know the official. Or the yeah, there, there's even a map um, where you can trace each of them uh, into the okay. city, and yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's complicated. And, 
Um, do you know anything about the fee system there they have for, for those jumping grounds? Because maybe you have heard about the fee system here in Austria um, and how it's regulated here. Is it any, anyhow comparable? Uh, Astoria, uh, what? Uh, is, is, is the fee system for um, those mm -hmm. places anyhow comparable to the one we have in Austria? If you have heard that, or do you know about um, if there are high fees or? Uh, yeah, the, uh, this is this is a very really good topic you are you are putting a finger on. Um, the thing is, like in in Mexico, the uh, the fees for waste collection and management are not directly charged to the citizens. It's more like uh, when you own a, a place or you pay your taxes, some part of it goes into the waste management. So the citizens don't have a sense about how much it costs to to actually make good disposition of the waste. Uh, and makes the problem com uh, more complex because then people really don't mind about not separating or uh, they don't care about the amount of waste they are producing. And yeah, I mean, there is, um, uh, when, I, I, when I used to work uh, for the Secretary of uh, Environment, but in, in my state, we were addressing this problem. We create a, even a huge document that was onto uh, pointing into that problem and even suggesting uh, some uh, fees for waste uh, management and collection to the citizens. But the problem here, it's more political because the, uh, there is no politician that will start to put new fees, especially on, the, on like uh, voting times and stuff. Uh, so the problem is really complex to, to solve because it's kind of a political suicide uh, to to start charging uh, the fees directly to the people. But in reality, this is what it will help the most to solve the problem, in my opinion, but it's... Okay, thank you for the very interesting insight and for your presentation in general. It was very, very interesting. Y saludos desde Vienna. Thank you so much. Saludos. Um, there are some other questions also yes, via chat. I Yes, I have. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, we yes. hear you. Yes. Um, thank you also for uh, um, your presentation. It was good to have some pictures uh, to, to imagine the things better. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first, uh, concerning uh, water and second, uh, concerning traffic. Um, I think if um, using water from the tube uh, for, for, uh, as, uh, to drink, mm -hmm. when it is not possible, I think it is uh, a very hard thing to order it uh, uh, to be transported into my house. Isn't, aren't there um, any, um, any systems uh, how to uh, um, filtrate uh, water in the households. This is very usually usual in Germany, maybe also in Austria, although we don't have um, the problem that the water is too bad. But don't they think about this? And the other question is, who is the owner of um, uh, and uh, seller of the drinking water? Is it uh, Nestle or any... Um, any, um, uh, I don't know, firma, uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, company. company, company from, from Mexico. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, I mean, the thing, or for example, I, I, I don't know if I will be able to correctly uh, answer the question, but uh, for example, a big problem that has been seen for, for filtration systems is that they do not remove uh, a lot of pollutants. And when you are extracting water from aquifers that are really, really deep, or as, as you take water from the, from the, from the aquifer, uh, the more you extract it, deeper than the next wells need to be, and they need to extract the water deeper and deeper and so on. And at some point, uh, if it's too deep, it can happen that, they, uh, that the temperature in the ground is a bit higher 
and some other compounds are dissolved into this water. So these compounds are um, not easy to, to treat. And in some cases, even, I don't know, really, uh, I, I don't have the, the exact uh, amount of the compounds and stuff, but in some cases, even dangerous. Uh, so I think, I mean, there are some uh, filter systems that are being commercialized in, in Mexico and there are some people utilizing them. But in general, it's not common at all. Um, I, I don't know why. I also think that depending on where your water is taken from, it could be a reasonable solution to this thing. Uh, but in reality, well, uh, it's a complex problem. And uh, some, I think for some people, will not be a good idea to do this. But uh, And regarding the other thing of the water, yes, uh, a lot of Nestle is one of the commercializers of, of, of water, of like uh, drinkable water in Mexico. Uh, one of them, uh, I mean, um, it, it's funny, you know, because they extract the water from the aquifer as any other well, and they just make it potable through a treatment process and then put, in, put it into vessels and sell it to, to the Mexicans. Uh, a lot more expensive than, than uh, it, it, it really is. Uh -huh. And now to traffic, is there um, uh, mm -hmm. a, a limitation of um, private uh, car driving, private traffic, like they do it in uh, huge cit cities like uh, Hong Kong or Singapore, East ETC? Uh, I'll say, could you repeat the question? I think my internet was... Yeah, um, is, is there in Mexico... Um, a limitation mm -hmm. for a private car driving. Uh, yes, there is this this uh, this program I mentioned. Uh, it's called like no circulation or something. And depending on the number of, of your plate, there is a calendar. And uh, by certain days, uh, some numbers are not allowed to go through the city. Uh, so yeah, there's some limitation on the traffic. And even though there's still huge amounts of tra traffic jams in Mexico City. I, yes. I think any person that have been traveling or moving through Mexico City could could address that it's a problem, even though there's strict limitations onto it. And there are not uh, huge uh, efforts uh, to build up the public traffic? Uh, I think I think the direction of the government, it's exactly towards public transportation. So, I mean, new lines are created every year and estimations and stuff. So, I mean, the government, it is trying to, to make people to leave the cars and start using public transport. Uh, I mean, Mexico City has a huge um, subway uh, network uh, that works really well and has a subsidy. Uh -huh. It's subsidized by the government as well, so it's not it's affordable to every person to use uh, the the metro system or the subway system. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, thank you. There was You're another welcome. related question from um, from Claudio Steiner about public transportation, and it's like it was the same, uh, but also who uses the public transportation. Okay, um, well, in, in Mexico City, most of the public transport, or I don't know if I will be able to address, or I, I don't know if I, I get correctly the sense of the question, but who uses it? Well, uh, I would say the big majority of, of the uh, inhabitants of Mexico City are moving uh, with public transport. Like the amount of people that it's uh, using a car, it's probably 15% of the of the inhabitants, inhabitants of Mexico City, or the people with a bit more wellness uh, uh, is the one that it's not moving in public transport, but I would say the, a big majority of, of uh, inhabitants in Mexico City is using public transport. So there's also one question that came from Rodrigo. Um, do you think we will be able to mitigate some of the issues we have in the short term or we are looking more into future? Uh, thanks for the question. Mm, I think I think the 
I mean, at least the direction the government in Mexico City uh, it's going, it, it's the right way. Uh, they, are, they have been trying to put a lot of different programs and solutions that have been successfully applied in all the mega cities in the world. And it, this complex is kind of ambiguous because it depends which problem. In, in short term, I think it's really, really hard to, to achieve some uh, traceable uh, improvements. Uh, I think the, the, the solution or the mitigation will be definitely more visible in middle term and long term. If the, the strategies that are really nice written in papers and documents uh, about climate change mitigation, water availability and stuff are taken seriously and they, there should be a continuity uh, onto the application of these strategies. And normally these strategies are always renovated when there is some change on the government and, and so on. So I think the direction is good. Uh, I mean, I think the problem in Mexico as well, it's, it goes beyond environmental issues. It's, it's a problem more related to, to education and human rights stuff mixed with different things because, um, I mean, it's nice or it's really desirable that people start to separate the ways in, in nice ways, but, uh, but if without education, without a really strong socialization campaigns, this will be really hard to achieve. Uh, so I, I don't know if I <laughs> addressed that correctly, but thanks for your questions. Good, there is one more question from Anna from the chat. Um, I would love to know, or first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I would love to know what you think of the measures taken by the city against the environmental problems I think yeah yeah well um, I mean it has been a, I think there is a lot of measures being taken the, what we don't know if it's this will be enough or um, I mean environmental problems are really complex problems and especially in a city a mega city like this you know that almost 23 million people living in this uh, area it's it's crazy, you know. It's a bit crazy and it's a bit madness. So to uh, to be able to to see really really big changes, structural changes, uh, they need to come uh, from the population itself, and they need to um, the public is the one that should be pushing the government towards more strict measures. But it's not that way. It's it's being the opposite way. No, the government, it's like, okay, they know, they have good specialists. There's a lot of really well-prepared people in some positions and they are fighting against this, but sometimes it feels like the, not all the inhabitants are, are conscious about all the programs and measures and uh, things that are being taken. So I, I hope I answer that. It's, it's also an ambiguous question. So, uh, I, I hope I, I, I answer it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, Elizabeth has also a question. So please, Elizabeth, um, it's your turn. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hello, OK. Um, well, can of you answer? I wanted to, to ask you uh, what would be, would be your insight on the current administration programs in Mexico City. And I'm saying that uh, because uh, around the elections, um, there was a lot of expectation on Claudia Sheinbaum as, as she has been a mm -hmm. scientist and she has been working for the IPCC or collaborating. And, yes. um, but what I see or for what, what you mentioned is that uh, most of the policy, uh, it's not, well, it's the, the answer to the possible solutions are given um, to citizens in the way, in the sense of um, recycling is responsibility of them. But I don't mm -hmm. see like a main um, or like overall uh, policy there. And mm -hmm. you, you mentioned it, um, there are some interconnections uh, to other problems. But mm -hmm. for example, what about, um, it, it, and I see it's not only education, it's not uh, only human rights. There's, for example, the, the case of security. Many people use uh, private transportation because of the, um, the way they feel uh, using uh, public transport. And, and, also, and also the uh, quality of air. Um, I mean, it could interconnect with other topics. So basically, it would be what would be your insight on, on this uh, new administration? 
Um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear that last uh, part of the... Just, uh, uh, yes, Alejandro, uh, just a um, uh, general overview, but from a um, more um, overall policy, not, not directing the responsibility to the citizens. Yeah, um, okay. I, I mean, in my opinion, there is always a, a stricter way to, to push the things faster, no? Uh, I mean, for example, in, in Austria, it's forbidden since 2004 to take organic waste to, to landfills. It's strictly forbidden. It's all utilized in compost or by, for, for biogas generation and then energy production. And all of these projects in Mexico are kind of being stopped. Uh, in in different way in by different reasons by different ways by different interests so of course there is always a way to accelerate the change and to apply the policies in a really changing game situations but in a context where we have a city of this size and a waste generation of thirteen thousand tons per day uh, a change of policy like this could create a lot of chaos if you are not prepared for that change. So this is this balance between the the radical change and if you are ready for that, because uh, I mean there is many many ways to to accelerate the change and, and and stuff and force people to start doing different things, but it's um, yeah it's also um, I mean as I as I mentioned all of these environmental problems are related. No? So if you incentive mobility, then we will have a lot of reduction, or you will see the reduction of, on the criteria pollutants through the years. And this has been, for example, some successful uh, since 2000, according to the um, to Dr. Uh, Leonora Rojas Bracho or uh, some researches uh, from the National. Autonomous University of Mexico, for example. But uh, I mean, there's always ways, yes, to 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 generate changes faster. But it's, it's in the middle, no? If it's good or bad, or uh, it's too drastic, uh, will people accept it or not? And at the end, a lot of decisions of the government are always made to not mess with the people because they don't want to have thousands of people outside of their offices with the torches and. Uh, ready to to attack them or something. So, I mean, the public opinion it's also important in this in this all interaction of environment problems. So it's it's a whole uh, component. If you move something, then some other things will will jump around and will not be uh, happy, or maybe they will. And so there's so many things to consider uh, in this case. I, so I hope I answer your question a bit. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So. Now it's Mario's turn. Perfect. <laughs> Hi, Alejandro. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you, man, because it's a very important topic, quite, quite popular right now. And I think as a Mexicans, we really must take care of this topic as, a, as let's say, as a new or old generation that, that matters everyone. And if we don't do anything about it, man, no, it's gonna it's gonna be worse. Um, and related with the two last questions, I have a a, a tricky question for you because it's, I think it's a, a a big topic too. But from a scale from one to ten or one to seven depends of how many factors I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna mention it. But which factor could be let's say the first one and could be the last one in your opinion and uh, that may may have an influence of the um, measures pro environmental issues in mexico first uh, i mean could be the cultural one social cultural one political one um, manufacturing one economic one and the global one. I mean, and, uh, about the many uh, deals and and trades that we have with, with for, for example, with the USA or with South America. Yeah. Uh, okay. So thanks. Thanks for for your question. And um, um, I, I I totally agree with what you say at the beginning. You no, know? like um, as a new generation of, of Mexicans, we need to to push this this topic and to 
point it out uh, of it and say what's wrong and complain about it and uh, pursue changes uh, uh, by by ourselves and then try to generate changes around us as well. Uh, and on the factors that are more decisive onto this, I think definitely education it's it's the key factor here uh, because. There, there will no, there will be no measure that the government can force people to do if the people uh, do, does not understand why they need to do it. No, so I mean, um, depending on which specific topic or which specific problem would you like to attack or or tackle down, uh, depends how the socialization of programs and uh, educational programs should should be uh, developed, in my opinion. Uh, so I think the education plays a huge role and I think the economic factor is as well important, but not that decisive as education or um, socialization of, of uh, different programs and actions. Because um, I can't remember who, who, who was asking about or who was uh, compared Mexico with, with Austria and gen in general with Europe, um, because is, I mean, here in Europe or in Austria, it was more a political agenda issues, uh, mm -hmm. issue that may may have a strong influence in, in this pro-environmental measurements. But in Mexico, I think political agenda may be, but I think what you say about education and information, because when people know what is going on, right? I mean, like really know, what is going on, they could be a little bit aware about it. But if they are not aware and they think, for example, like the current topic about COVID-19, uh, when they know or when they imagine that this is just a, an, 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 uh, 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 so, um, a bad joke or kind of that this is do, do, doesn't, do, doesn't exist or, or even our president say that, I mean, think about how 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 much is gonna affect those kind of pro environmental agenda in in Mexico. When they say like it doesn't matter if you don't separate your your your, your trash, just mm -hmm. put it in the same ton and and it's gonna be okay. Or it's gonna be separated when they 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 they, they came to the to the to the um to those places. But it's I mean. I don't know if really people, if people in Mexico is really aware about what what is going on right now with the, with the whole the whole trash and the the whole pollution, and when cars also are demanded. I mean, even if you have like twelve or thirteen lines of of metro, I mean, how you know? But I'm quite quite uh, uh, agree with you about the, the thing of education and information. Yeah, and thank you very much, man. It was, it was quite interesting. I'm happy that you like it. <laughs> okay, so there's one more question from Philip. Um, in terms of providing resources to such a big city as Mexico City, are there any problems created in surrounding areas? Are there resources deviated to the capital from other regions where the same are then missing? I can imagine some like this to, for water. Yeah, mm, yeah uh, Philip, the, thanks for your question. And the answer is yes, of course, definitely. The, uh, I mean, for example, um, on the Lerma Basin, we have, uh, um, I mean, for example, imagine all the waste uh, water, no? So we have a huge amount of uh, wastewater coming out of Mexico City as well. Uh, and it goes to base, you know, and this problem gets bigger and bigger because normally so, there are some environmental impacts that are uh, accumulative. So if you keep throwing pollutants into a river, into a basin, and they are coming down and they, they arrive to another city and this other city uh, keeps putting more onto it and more onto it, the final person or when it gets to the sea then the uh, I mean the, the rivers have uh, some some clearance time and stuff but but it's it's too much you know the, the load uh, the amount of resources that this city requires it's it's overwhelming for sure and this certainly affects uh, all the surroundings and um, 
um, resource availability is being compromised uh, since many years, in my opinion. And, and I think, uh, just for giving an exam uh, one example, we are aware, no? because there's, there's some kind of problems even between the states, like why you are polluting this river where I need to take water from, but it's super polluted when, you, when it arrives because you are throwing your waste there. No? And then it's like circle and some, even some uh, fights between states and uh, like, yeah, um, for giving just one example, you no know, water, it's certainly a big example for this. I think you are mute, Maya. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. One more question from Joe Erbler is: um, What about the sewage system? Is it cleared or just going into the ground mostly? The sew sewage system. Uh, I mean, there is there is a, a huge amount of water that it's treated, and Mexico City has one of the biggest uh, wastewater treatment plants. Uh, in in the world, I think. Uh, so yeah, there is there is uh, definitely. Um, I mean, it's not all the wastewater just being thrown into a basin and stuff. There is wastewater treatment, of course. There is wastewater treatment options, but some phenomenon regarding this is that a lot of wastewater treatment facilities are being abandoned after some years because the operation and maintenance of them could tend to be high, especially for places that are not so big. I mean, Mexico City, this is clearly not a problem because they, there is enough uh, money to keep maintaining these facilities and stuff. But, but yeah, I mean, there is a lot of problems regarding um, uh, basins and rivers being wasted by companies and, and stuff like the, the, the justice procurement of environment, it's overwhelmed since many, many years. Uh, there's not enough people there to check and to go and find every every company, uh, every um, company that it's polluting or it's getting out of the law and etc. So this is a problem that has been addressed since many years that the procurement of justice for or for environmental justice it's since many many years overrun uh, definitely. So I think this also this is also a huge problem that makes environmental justice really flow and. Uh, almost inexistent in some terms. Yeah, so we are already going to the end of the time, but uh, because we also uh, talked about um, the younger generation, I wanted to ask you if uh, Friday for Future is also a movement in Mexico City and how is it among the younger people and the topic? Yeah, um, yeah. Fridays for the Future, I think definitely also reach Mexico. Um, many cities in Mexico, especially Mexico City or the main big cities, uh, is the one that have been following this movement. And I mean, I think it's great no, that the young generation is the most cons concerned about uh, environmental problems because at the end, they will be the ones that would need to deal with these problems. So, I mean, I found it amazing uh, that, especially, I, I think here I'm really shocked every time I see uh, so much people involved, so much people doing and reacting to, towards climate change, uh, demanding uh, uh, integral huge changes within the system uh, to political actors to every, in every aspect. And you can also see that they are congruent with what they say and do because at the end, that's that's the point. What's the point of just uh, point out what you are doing wrong, but if you also not doing anything for it? So I think this movement it's it's really strong, and I think it's growing, and I hope it keeps growing and keep pushing. And I think it will create changes in in, in many ways, and that's that's the way um, to get involved. It's it's really important and it's something that Mexican society have forgotten somehow. And I think it's also important that we remember that, that we need to go to the streets and complain and point it out at, at the things that are wrong or that the things that we want to change. Because at the end, it should be like that, that the, the people decide and yeah. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, so the last question comes then from Mario. <laughs> of course, thanks for all the questions. I'm happy to, I hope I am addressing them well or answering. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah, first of all, thanks a lot for your presentation. I'm wondering whether there are already any insights as to how the recently implemented programs such as Basura Cero are working. Like, I mean, you have said or you have already said that, of course, it's a process and you can't change things from one day to another. But do you feel or know how it's going? Like, for instance, uh, concerning the plastic bags, as when I was in Mexico last year, um, I don't know, purchases were put into plastic bags immediately and it was a job actually. Um, so is it not done anymore or how do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, as, as changes are, it, there are gradual, like, uh, there are, as I mentioned, yeah, they are not made from one day to the other. According to the law, yeah, the changes in law are made one day from the other. No, but they work, they make uh, reformation and stuff, then it's published officially, and then uh, people need to follow this new law, no? But, um, of course, there's, um, uh, I mean, I, I think it's going well, like a lot of states in Mexico already implement uh, the rejection of plastic bags in supermarkets and stuff like this. And at, at least the big supermarkets and, and big stores are, are taking this law into account and and not giving any more plastic bags to people to carry their things. Uh, but I think the hardest in this in this topic it's the the informal sector, no, and the small businesses, the small street markets, uh, etc., and so on and so on. They, for them, it's they are still using these kind of things and to force them to change uh, or to um, to achieve the change in this informal sector will be probably the biggest challenge. But it will gradually start to change, and as people also start to being conscious conscious about the problem of plastic bags, they, they will also bring their own stuff to carry the things as it's done in Europe for some years already. And, but I mean, so overall, I think this measure have been taking a good response of, of Mexicans. And I think you, you could see the problem uh, uh, better if you go now to Mexico, but still probably you could see some plastic bags in some stores. So I don't, I hope I answered your question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much, Alejandro, for your great presentation, and thank you everybody for discussion and your questions. Um, there's still one question about if it's possible to reach you also via mail or something. Could, could you share it maybe in the chat with us, Alejandro? It would be of great. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. So feel free to send me an email or if you have some more questions, I, on my free time, I, I could answer them or try to find you an answer. So feel free to write me. This is my personal email and. Um... Yeah, <laughs> great. Yeah, so <laughs> really, really great that um, this uh, event took place and yeah, that it was also possible to do it online now. Uh, a pity that you couldn't come to Salzburg, but yeah, like this, we also have the chance to have more people from all around <laughs> here in the meeting. And yeah, we wish everybody a nice evening. And yeah, see you somewhere else. <laughs> Thanks for your attention and nice questions. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.